<laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Happy holidays. This will be my full Marvel What If Season 2 Episode 3 video. It's basically their Christmas episode. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references here, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. And careful for spoilers, if you haven't seen the episode yet, we'll just start at the beginning, work our way through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs and WTF moments. Starting with the episode title, What If Happy Hogan Saved Christmas, with Happy Hogan essentially becoming a version of the freak, version of his character from the older Marvel comics in a parody of the Die Hard movie, with him being kind of like the John McClane character, except in the episode, they use him as more of like a purple version of the Hulk. So it's basically What If Happy Hogan Turned Into the Hulk. Ah, oh, no one you're beat, freak. <laughs> If you're not a big comic book reader, Happy Hogan became the freak during Tales of Suspense number 74. It was kind of an Iron Man story, like he got involved with a bunch of Iron Man's technology and accidentally was turned into the freak. Like his face changed, everything about him changed, he wound up having to fight Iron Man for a little while till Iron Man was able to stop him and then take his powers away. The creators of the show actually said part of the deal that got Jon Favreau to come back and do the voice for Happy Hogan in season one is that when he came back, he said, okay, I'll do this, but during season two, you have to give me my own episode and you have to let me become a version of the freak from the comics. So this episode was basically their way of paying that off. During the Marvel intro, they play an Avengers-themed version of the 12 Days of Christmas song. Generally throughout the entire episode, there's a bunch of different holiday types of references, different movies, different songs, all kinds of holiday-themed things. This time, the Watcher appears a little bit more fully, confirming my theory that just like in Season 1, like you see a little bit more of him in each episode, till eventually he starts revealing himself to the actual characters in the different universes. He claims that Christmas is his favorite time of year. He spends his time watching all these different universes, so it is interesting to know that Christmas is his favorite time of year, and he uses that to tell a Christmas story about this particular universe. Pretty much everybody from the Marvel movies came back to voice their characters again, with a few exceptions. John Favreau came back to do Happy Hogan, Kat Dennings came back to do Darcy, Kobe Smulders came back to do Maria Hill, Jeremy Renner came back to do Hawkeye, Mark Ruffalo came back to do Bruce Banner Hulk, Sam Rockwell came back to do Justin Hammer. We might also be getting him back in the live action MCU movies eventually too. Chris Hemsworth was back as Thor. Lake Bell does the voice for Black Widow, though she did it during season one, so like she just came back to do more Black Widow. She was also recently in Black Panther Wakanda Forever as like a completely different character. They had the same person who plays Iron Man in season one come back for season two. And if you didn't recognize him, Josh Keaton does the voice of Captain America. Like he'll do it Captain America in other episodes too. But he's also most notably the voice of Spectacular Spider-Man who just did a big cameo scene as that character in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. We know it's hard. But it's the truth, Miles. Maria Hill places this in the timeline, saying it's the first Christmas after the events of Avengers Age of Ultron, saying that the Christmas needs to go well because of the year they've had is kind of rough. Pretty much everything in this universe is similar to the way things went down in the MCU, with like one exception to what happened to Justin Hammer after the events of Iron Man 2. Like that's the only thing that changed. The camera zooms in on a snow globe that the Watcher starts reciting the night before Christmas poem to set up the Thor bookend at the end of the episode where Thor completes the poem and they pick up in the middle of the Avengers fight against Happy Hogan Hulk. Notice all the stockings for all the different Avengers hanging above the chimney. This is inside that top level where their lounge, the bar was in Avengers Age of Ultron, where they had their big party at. They played the game to see who could lift Thor's hammer. They're all dressed in Christmas attire because they were off doing different things. Some of them on other missions, some of them doing charity work, some of them trying to get toys. The Watcher does that storytelling trope, the record scratch moment where he's like, oh, pause things like he pauses this universe. We should probably tell you how things started and then rewinds to the beginning of the story. Right. You're probably wondering who this guy is. Perhaps I should start a bit further back. They make a minor change with the what if intro scene, blending Happy Hogan Hulk with it, making it purple for a second. But the rest of the intro is the exact same as all the other episodes. They explain that in this universe, the Avengers are about to have a holiday charity gala and Happy Hogan's in charge of getting the tower ready like he did during Spider-Man Homecoming, basically doing the same type of thing like background organizational stuff. You just gotta load Tony's old Hulkbuster armor, prototype for Cap's new shield, and the megging, the meg, the... Thor's magic belt. And while they're doing this, they just also happen to have Jarvis offline defragging, just getting ready to upgrade his AI systems. 
There are a couple inconsistencies though, like Jarvis should still not be online inside the Avengers Tower, but on Happy Hogan's phone later in the episode, he has Harley Keener, so like it's after the events of Iron Man 3, which happened after Age of Ultron when Iron Man started using the Friday AI. The whole idea in the MCU is that Jarvis essentially was destroyed by Ultron, but then he wound up becoming part of Vision, like Vision is the baby of both Ultron and Jarvis. I think that was just an oversight on the part of the people that were making the episode. Like, he knows Harley Keener, Iron Man 3 has happened, so that's how he has Harley Keener's phone number, but also the Iron Legion is still around and they're still using the Jarvis AI. They explain that at this point in history, Darcy is interning at the Avengers Tower. They make a couple jokes about her being a perpetual intern, like she's never actually had a paying job, like she just always interns everywhere she goes. She also makes a joke about being perpetually in college, like if you want college credit for this, you're gonna have to do what I say. In reality, she's incredibly smart. She has like several advanced degrees. That's why she's in college for so long. Like she's in university getting these PhDs. She makes a Bernard in accounting reference. That's a callback to what if season one in another reality. That was another accountant that wanted to get with Captain Carter. But in this reality, because things are a little bit more like they were in the MCU, Steve Rogers is Captain America. Darcy's parakeet joke is a callback to Iron Man 2 with Whiplash's parakeet that he had in that movie. They never explained what happened to the parakeet after the ending and it turned into a big meme in the fandom. Like everyone's always like, whatever happened to that parakeet, we're never gonna know. We're never gonna find out. Happy Hogan tells her to get more maraschino cherries to get rid of her basically because they have an entire jar and Iron Man doesn't drink hot toddies anymore because he's a recovering alcoholic. Kobe Smulders comes back as Maria Hill in the episode when she references having a bad year. Like I said, it's the aftermath of Avengers Age of Ultron. Darcy talks about her Hanukkah playlist because if you didn't realize she's Jewish inside the MCU. Mariah Carey though is just like a general holiday mainstay. She's probably made more money on her holiday albums than any other recording artist in history. The Christmas song of Mariah Carey's that's on loop is a reference to All I Want for Christmas, which she later congratulates Justin Hammer for when he uses that song in his wordplay. Justin Hammer then enters the Avengers Tower, finishing the night before Christmas poem, reciting the ending, which Thor also does at the end of the episode. And the Watcher makes a reference to how the Grinch stole Christmas basically explaining how his history went differently in this universe. Like during the events of Iron Man 2, he gets thrown in prison after that movie happens and just thinks of a plan to steal Iron Man's technology, then finds out about the Hulk blood and wants to give himself powers. Notice in his magazine in prison too, there's a reference to the science bros and the cooking meme, like what is he cooking? What are they cooking? This is also where the plot of the episode kind of turns into a diehard parody with him being kind of like Alan Rickman's character, Hans Gruber. Notice he's using Russian goons again, just like in Iron Man 2, Venko was Russian. He pretends to use the plot of the Christmas Story movie as his own childhood, which everybody recognizes instantly. Like everybody in the room is like, wait a minute, isn't that the plot of a movie? Fun fact too, some of you probably realize this, but the main star of that movie, Peter Billingsley, also wound up playing William Ginter Riva in the first Iron Man movie, then came back in Spider-Man Far From Home as part of the Mysterio plot. He takes control of the Iron Legion when he calls them Johnny Fives. That's another movie reference to Short Circuit. They make a lot of references to movies in general, not just holiday movies, but movies in general during this episode. Darcy starts singing a version of Good King Wenseless with herself and Steve Rogers' Captain America inserted into the lyrics. She also does the full version of the song during the post credit scene. This is like the first episode that actually has a post credit scene. The whole plot here with Justin Hammer wanting the Hulk blood to turn himself into a version of the Hulk is something they literally just did on the She-Hulk series. Everybody wanting the Hulk's blood to become versions of the Hulks or replicate the powers of the Hulk somehow. They're also supposed to turn Thunderbolt Ross into a version of Red Hulk during Captain America 4. So a lot of Hulk related stuff just happening in the MCU right now like we just got Scar, Son of Hulk 2. Reportedly, Marvel is also working on their new solo Hulk movie. Supposedly, they figured out whatever their deal with Universal was behind the scenes, but no idea when that movie would actually happen. Justin Hammer makes another Sokovia reference to hiring Sokovian goons instead of Russian goons. Then they do more literal diehard references where Happy Hogan starts crawling through the elevator shaft in the vents, just like John McClane. We find out that Iron Man has his own special private bathroom in the Avengers Tower. It makes sense that he would have this. He owns everything, like it belongs to him financially, so he'd probably have his own private sanctuaries around the tower. Kind of sounds like Justin Hammer wants to leave him an upper decker, gonna leave him a little present for Christmas. There are a bunch of Christmas songs throughout the episode. The one that he plays here when he goes into the lounge is Broadway Shingling. Most of the other songs, though, are Christmas themed songs. 
They imply that Iron Man's actual true villain, like the only thing he's actually afraid of, is having to pay taxes because he's so wealthy. Justin Hammer also implies that he learned martial arts while he was in Seagate prison. That might be a slight reference to the Shang-Chi movie because of what happened with Wen Wu, the Ten Rings coming to abduct Trevor, and that being such a heavy martial arts themed movie. This place that Happy Hogan gets into where they're storing the Hulk's blood is just one of the other storage facilities for projects they're working on, like a Science Bros storage shed basically, glorified storage shed. He clocks Hawkeye's confetti arrow, which he uses later in the episode, also using it to joke, clowning on Hawkeye, renting him out for parties. They make a bunch of Hawkeye jokes in this episode about how unpopular as a character he is. Somewhere out there, Kate Bishop is being offended by all this. And Happy accidentally gets injected with the Gamma Serum and starts turning into a purple Hulk. But he's also meant to be a reference to the freak version of his character. I just said, like, they're using him as more of a purple Hulk in the episode. He winds up in the room where they create the new Avengers suits with copies of their old suits on display. They make a couple of spandex jokes in here, too. The purple spandex is for the Hulk's spandex pants that don't rip when he grows. Later, they make another Die Hard reference when he uses it to jump to the lower floor. John McClane did something similar in the Die Hard movie. The I Love LA coffee mug on the desk, I think, is also meant to be a reference to the suit maker in Los Angeles during the She-Hulk series, where Daredevil also went to get his new suits made. They've got posters of the Avengers all over this room too, including posters of their holiday suits that they made them for this particular episode, like their actual superhero suits that are just holiday themed. Happy flips through the contacts on his phone and there are a bunch, a bunch of references. So just starting at the top, working our way down, A. Bradley is A. C. Bradley. She's one of the showrunners on the What If TV series. M. Chauncey is one of the other showrunners. Everhart here is Christine Everhart from the Iron Man movies. G. Fisher is one of the editors on What If, like a lot of these people are just crew members. Then he's got Nick Fury, Maria Hill's number below him. H. Keener is Harley Keener from Iron Man 3, confirming this is set after the events of Iron Man 3. C. Klein is Cameron Klein, who was a S.H.I.E.L.D. co-worker of Maria Hill's during Winter Soldier. S. Lee is obviously Stan Lee. J. Lincoln is Janice Lincoln, a.k.a. Lady Beetle, who's from the Captain America comics. She's also the daughter of Tombstone. She's appeared in some of the Spider-Man comics in the past. Then we get Pepper Potts below her, Rhodey below her, Steve Rogers below him, General Thunderbolt Ross below him, Black Widow, then Tony Stark, Sam Wilson at the bottom, who's still Falcon at this point in history. Then he calls Black Widow, who's at the Russian ballet performance of Nutcracker in another part of town, taking out a foreign assassin. The other thing about this too, I think is a bit of a Black Widow reference because all the Black Widows that go through the Red Room are trained in ballet, even Black Widow Natasha herself. Iron Man and Captain America are playing Santa and his elf at a charity event and he's getting salty because the little kid sounds like he would rather have a Captain America shield as a Christmas toy than an Iron Man toy and Captain America is getting mobbed by all the MILFs that want America's ass. Bruce Banner and Hawkeye are doing a parody of the Schwarzenegger movie Jingle All the Way which is a Christmas movie where he battles Sinbad over getting the last remaining Turbo Man toy before Christmas. They even gave Hawkeye some of the dialogue from the Jingle All the Way movie saying that he can't return home like his wife said don't come home without the toy. Obviously the joke here clowning on Hawkeye is that he's not popular nobody wants to buy his toys like only one person bought a Hawkeye toy it was probably Kate Bishop or a younger version of the character. They're basically trying to dump them here, like they discounted them to 25% just to try and get rid of them. But all of the Iron Man toys are almost sold out, like there's one left because he's such a popular character. And their logos are also the same logos from their comics. Bruce Banner is wearing a Christmas sweater. This is another reference to the Science Bros. He makes a Hulk joke saying that the sun's getting real low, implying that if Hawkeye doesn't give him that Iron Man toy to the little girl, he'll turn into the Hulk and smash him. Darcy and Happy make a bunch of movie references. Con Air, which was Nicolas Cage, he also played Ghost Rider in the Marvel movies. Under Siege was Steven Seagal. Happy makes the Die Hard reference. Darcy also makes a Blockbuster video reference. In real life, I've actually got my rental card from Blockbuster still. Those things are like collector's items now. So let me know if you actually still have your rental card from Blockbuster. She also calls Nick Fury the scary dude with the eye patch. They introduce the sub-basement of the Avengers Tower. We've never actually been there before. Like, there are a couple places in the Avengers Tower they visit in this episode that we've never been. Darcy also references Reginald Vell Johnson, who was also in the Die Hard movie, and he was also in a deleted scene from Avengers Endgame meant to show what Professor Hulk was doing before the events when he shows up in the diner. They wound up getting rid of the scene, but for like a brief hot second, Reginald Vell Johnson was in the Marvel movies. When he destroys the punching bag, that's also a reference to Captain America doing the same thing in the first Avengers movie. 
All the men running through the stairs also reminded me of Hulk from Endgame, like Hulk versus stairs. Darcy makes a Darth Vader Star Wars reference. Star Wars has been referenced in a bunch of Marvel movies a bunch of different times, so it's canon inside the MCU. Make all the Mace Windu Nick Fury jokes. She makes a Chronicles of Narnia reference and then goes through Iron Man's other suit AIs. He doesn't have every single one here, like they don't list them all, but there are several. She finds Friday, Wadsworth, I think is a reference to one of the crew members working on the Marvel movies. Edith, obviously a reference to the Edith glasses from Spider-Man Far From Home. Werner is a reference to Werner Von Braun from real life World War II that started building rockets for the United States for NASA. But in the episode, they use it more as a Werner Herzog joke. And in real life, John Favreau, who plays Happy Hogan, he directed the first two Iron Man movies too, is also the showrunner on The Mandalorian and was responsible for casting Werner Herzog during season one. Talk about meta Easter eggs and connections here. Justin Hammer reveals he was going to use the Hulk blood to turn himself into a Hulk and use it to make people think that he was becoming a hero, redeeming himself. Probably something similar would happen during Armor Wars if he comes back trying to steal Iron Man's technology. They make another reference to Iron Man's Friday AI when he calls Darcy Your Girl Friday. That's actually the movie that Iron Man got the name of the AI from. It's a Cary Grant movie about a person who falls in love with a woman that works for him, and it's a reference in the MCU to him falling in love with Pepper Potts. He makes a joke about Iron Man getting Captain America Iron Man themed socks as a joke based on their rivalry between the two of them. They pay off the joke with Hawkeye's confetti arrow, and then Justin Hammer takes the Hulkbuster while Happy destroys the entire Iron Legion. So RIP, press F to pay respects to the Iron Legion. He also calls Happy Hogan Hulk Hogan. Then they make a bunch of Justin Hammer Santa Claus references because he is wearing a giant red suit, the Hulkbuster. Darcy makes a bunch of computer references, like the Pinwheel of Death is a Mac reference. Control Alt Delete is an oldie but a goodie way to reboot your computer. They make the Werner Herzog parody with the Werner AI voice, but it's not actually Werner Herzog coming back to do the voice himself. When Happy is fighting Justin Hammer, they use the same move that Iron Man used on the Hulk in Avengers Age of Ultron to try and get him to stop by punching him repeatedly. We get the Avengers back, they fight Happy Hogan Hulk for a hot second until they realize what's actually going on, and he shouts Justin Hammer out the window then saves him. Presumably, they just threw him back in Seagate prison after this. When he jokes about being stuck this way, in the comics, Happy Hogan did eventually turn into the Freak again, implying that he will turn into this Purple Hulk eventually again. We get a little more holiday wordplay from the Watcher, completing Iron Man's dialogue here about them going in for food. Then Thor shows up at the end of the episode, it is Chris Hemsworth to finish the Watcher's Night Before Christmas poem with him watching from the sky. We get a little more Christmas music playing over the end credits and a surprise post credit scene, like the first one they've done this season so far. All right. Thor has a giant neck, it is full of muscles. <laughs> Happy Holidays! This time it's Darcy singing more of her Captain America version of Good King Wenseless, but this time it's like the full version of the song with the Avengers characters inserted lyrics, like a bunch of Thor stuff in here too. There's also a special thanks to Roy Thomas in the end credits here too, but it's in every single episode because Roy Thomas was one of the Marvel comic book creators that helped create the What If comics. There are a bunch of Easter eggs and references in the episode, so if you spotted any that I didn't mention in the video, just write them below in the comments, and my full episode 4 video will post tomorrow on actual Christmas Day. So it's going to be the Iron Man on Sakaar episode, it'll be the same person playing the Iron Man character. Click here for that, I'll update the link as soon as I post that, and click here for all my other What If episodes. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and happy holidays!